To return evil for good is devilish. To return good for good is human. But to return good for evil is godlike. He who is born of God should grow to resemble his father. If you are born of God, you must grow to resemble your father. Therefore, there are two marks of a Christian. What are these marks? Mark of giving and mark of forgiving. We must learn to give and learn to forgive. Our topic tonight is the believer's name. The believer's name. What do we mean by the believer's names? What did the Bible call the believers? As a Christian, do you know God has a name for you? Do you know there, is, there are names that God has released which you need to carry wherever you go? You are not a child of Satan. You are not a child of demons. You are not afraid of Satan either. But you are a child of God. You have names that God has given to you that will enable you to be a victor and not a victim. When we come to the Lord Jesus Christ, there are two things that happen in our lives. What happened? One, we have a new life. Life that is based upon the word. Life that people, anyone who sees us will see, yes, there's a new life in this person. This person is no more what he used to be, but now he's a brand new person. Secondly, you have a new partnership. Oh, glory to God. No more partnership with Satan. Now, partnership with God. Through Christ Jesus. So we're going to look at this one by one. When we talk about having a new life, the Bible declared in the book of Matthew chapter 11 verse 28. What did the Bible say, Mormon? Matthew chapter 11 verse 28. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. 29. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your soul. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. That's Jesus speaking. Come unto me, all you have heavy laden, and I will give you rest. When you come to the Lord, you have a new life. The burden that used to be in you has been removed because the Lord will take that burden away from you. You are no more what you used to be. You become a brand new person, a person who no more carry the burden of iniquity. But Christ has taken them from you. And the yoke becomes easier. That's what the Bible tells us there. And how would this happen? When we reach out and embrace the saving grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Bible declares in 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Look, there are process there that we need to learn. What are those things? If we confess our sins, probably there's something that will be keeping you behind bars. There's something that will be keeping you under the power of guilt. Something that will be keeping you in bondage. The Bible says, if you confess your sins, he is faithful and just. He is faithful and righteous to forgive you and to, not only forgiving you, cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Cleanse you from the effect of that sin. That's what the Bible says. And that's the new life you had. When Apostle Paul was writing to the church of Ephesus in the book of Ephesians chapter 4, <laughs> In verse 24, 22, 23, 24, he made mention, it says, put off the old man and put on the new man, which is born in Christ Jesus. Take off the old man. When he wrote to the church of Romans, in the book of Romans chapter 13, verse 14, Apostle Paul says, now put on Christ. Because you have embraced a new life, you no more carry what you used to carry, excess luggage of sin. Now you're a free man. Oh, those angers that used to be in you, take them out. It doesn't belong to you anymore. Those lustfulness in you, no more. It doesn't belong to you, throw them out. Lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, and pride of life, take them out. 1 John chapter 2, verse 15 and 16. Take them out. It doesn't belong to you anymore. Because you have been freed from this. That's the new life we're talking about. In the book of Colossians, a moment. Let's go to the Colossians chapter 1. See what Apostle Paul wrote. Book of Colossians chapter 1. Look at verse 13 and 14. He had delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of his love, 
in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sin. He had taken us out from the kingdom of darkness and now brought us into the kingdom of his son whom he loved. We are no more what he used to be. We are brand new people. We have different kind of language we speak. We don't speak the language of filthiness anymore, but we speak language of holiness, purity, and righteousness. That's the new life. Now, what about the second thing? Partnership. New partnership with, with Christ. A new partnership with Christ. Which means our behavior and our relationship is no more what it used to be. Relationship. Our relationship is relation based on God. Based on godliness, righteousness, and holiness. That's why the Hebrew writer says in the book of Hebrew, chapter 2, verse 14. For without peace and holiness, no eye shall see the Lord. And the book of 1 Peter, chapter 1, verse 15 and 16, it says, Be thou holy, for I am holy. Be holy in your conversation. In every manner of your speeches, be holy. Say the Bible. When we look at the book of the law, the book of Leviticus, we call it the book of the law of the ministers. Leviticus chapter 11, Bible declares in verse 45, Be thou holy, for I am holy. Holiness unto the Lord. That's the partnership we have because the Lord God whom we are partnering with now is not a filthy God. He's a holy God. No filthy language anymore. So when we begin to partnership with God, something new happens. And what is that? In the book of Matthew chapter 18, we begin to operate in supernatural. Where the Bible declares in Matthew 18, 18, what you bind on earth is bound in heaven. What you lose on earth is losing. Why? Because you are partnershiping with God. You have a strong partnership with God. When you open your mouth to speak, something happens because every word that comes out of your mouth will be backed up by heaven because you have declared yourself completely divorced from the world. You are married to Jesus. That's why the psalmist says, I covenant my mouth that will speak no vow foul language or any gal. I, I cover my mouth. You will never allow filthy words to come out of your mouth, no matter how pressured or how angry you are. Because you know your mouth become mouth that is sanctified, <laughs> mouth that has now been completely transformed and changed for the glory of God. So when you open your mouth and speak something, devil will be trembling. Otherwise, they will say, I have partnership with your mouth. You're dead to scold me. You're dead to tell me to stop. So in the book of Matthew 18, verse 18, the Bible said, what you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. What we lose on earth, lose in heaven. You can declare war against Satan and Satan cannot, back, cannot be able to stand against you because your word carries weight. Your word carries weight. In the book of Job, Chapter 22, verse 28, the Bible says, when you decree, it shall be established. When you say stop, it shall be stopped. When you say allowed, it shall be allowed. Only by your word. Then in the book of Matthew, chapter 18, in verse 19, the Bible says, where two or three are God, what, 19 and 20, the Lord is there. Whatever you and your partner agrees on earth as asking shall be done. Because God will always honor your word. Therefore, in the book of Amos, chapter 4, the Bible says, can two work together unless they agree? You've got to agree. When you don't agree, if you don't agree with God, you cannot move on. That's why we talk about three principles of faith. The first principle is agreement. You must agree with God. Second principle, you must say what God says. Third principle, you must agree with what God said. Then you'll be able to operate with God or move with God in the supernatural. Now, as we become God's people, we have new names. First, we are called sons of God. In the book of John, chapter 1, verse 12, the Bible says, As many as receive him, he gave them power to become his children, his sons and daughters. That's what the Bible says. You are a child of God. The moment you embrace Jesus, you are no more child of the devil, you are no more child in the world, you are a child of God. In the book of Romans chapter 8 verse 14, the Bible said, as many as are led by the Spirit of God are sons and daughters of God. 
if you are led by the Spirit, not by the flesh. Because you completely get yourself out of the blanket of flesh and begin to live for God. Your words, your actions, your eyes, everything about you now has to be focused on God. And no more focusing on your lustfulness or your easy way of life, which you like to live. Next. The common spiritual weakness amongst Christians today is ignorance of what God says they are. Ignorance. Therefore, the Bible declares in the book of Hosea, it says, my people perish because of ignorance. Many Christians don't know who they are in Christ. They don't even know they are right. They don't even know what God has called them. God said, you are my son, you are my daughter. He didn't say you are their son. My son, he owns, God places his part of ownership upon you, the seal of ownership upon your life. You belong to him. Many Christians underestimate or undervalue themselves. Therefore, they will say, poor me, I'm just nothing. Well, you're not nothing. You are somebody because God made you somebody. Some people even think that they can do nothing. They have no power to do anything. They have no right. They are just nothing because they feel that somebody is suppressing them. If you're under the power of suppression, it's time for you to know who you are in Christ Jesus and get out from the mess and begin to move on. It's time for you to tell the devil, hey, devil, you can't mess around with me. Don't mess with me. I know my right. I know who I am. Secondly, you are called member of Christ's body. Member of the body of Christ, that's who you are. In the book of Ephesians chapter 5, in verse 30, 3, 0, the Bible declared and said that you are a member of Christ's body. It says, for we are members of his body, of his flesh and of his bones. You are a member of Christ's body. So if you are a member of Christ's body, the devil has no business to throw sickness upon you. Because you are hidden in Christ. Therefore, Satan must touch God, touch Christ, touch Holy Ghost before he touches you. So if Satan cannot touch God, cannot touch Christ, cannot touch Holy Ghost, then he cannot touch you because you are hidden there. Devil has no right to throw sickness upon your body. You know why you call it to be under the sickness? Because you have agreed with sickness. Hey, you have right to touch me. <laughs> But when you begin to, the Bible says, resist him and he will flee. Resist him in sincerity. You got to know Jesus Christ before you begin to claim the promises. Many of us want one leg there, one leg here. When we want God, we go to God. When we don't want God, we go to demons. That's what we do. You are a member of the body of Christ. God never intended that the church or the Christians should be defeated. God never intended that you be defeated. Progress, success belongs to you. You are a winner, you are not a loser because Christ made you a winner. The Bible declared in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verse 57, thanks be to God who makes us victorious. You are a victorious person. You are not a victim of circumstance or victim of situation. The gates of hell cannot prevail against you because you are a child of God and you are a member of the body of Christ. Satan cannot defeat you. Jesus proclaimed and declared this in Matthew chapter 16 verse 8. He said, the gate of hell cannot prevail against the church. You are the church, the body of Christ. Therefore, Satan cannot use you to play football. You need to kick him out of your life and resist him at all times and win him. Thirdly, you are a new creation. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 17 declared very clearly, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Therefore, if any man is in Christ, he is a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Everything about you now is new. You are no more what you used to be. You are a brand new person. All things have passed away. All things have become new. There are many Christians who are depending on their past. Every time they think about their past, and let, let me tell you this, there are also many Christians who use the past of people to hunt them. Don't forget what you did yesterday. Don't forget what, 
Ten years back, remember what you did. Seven years back, remember what you did. Don't let the devil use anyone to remind you of your past. The Bible declared in the book of Isaiah, chapter 43, verse 18 and 19, do not remember the things of old. Behold, I'm doing a new thing. He will make a way where there's no way, give you water in the desert. That's your God. Therefore, don't remember the past things. It's time you forget about them and kick them out of your life. You're a new person now. Yes, you made a mistake. You don't need to be killed. If God did not kill you for the mistakes because you repented of it, then man should not always revoke that very mistake to kill you. It's time you get out from the mess and don't let the devil to have you. In the book of Ephesians, chapter 2, verse 10, the Bible said, you are God's workmanship. You are made by God. You are God's workmanship. God's workmanship. God has made you. You are God. God did not throw you out. He just created you. That's why in the book of Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, 27, God said, let us make man in our own image. And in the image of God, he made man and woman. God made you. He molded you. He created you. He did not call you out. He created you. That's how precious we are. He created us. He molded us. Let us make man. Make, make, make. He molded us in his own image. And made us who we are today. And that's why you must rejoice. He did not call us. Remember, we did not call ourselves new creatures. God did. God said, now you're no more what you used to be. You're a brand new person. I've accepted you in the beloved. Therefore, embrace that very blessing that comes from God. We must be careful not to insult God by saying, oh, I am so poor, wretch me, and unworthy as I am. You know, some people think by praying that way, that will make God to say, oh, poor thing. Oh, Lord, I'm unworthy. Oh, Lord, I'm so poor. Oh, Lord, I'm so wretched. And they will say, yes, you are. Yes, you are. And you never get up from there. You are going to be there. Yes, you are. Because that is what you say you are. God didn't say you are unworthy. The Bible declared in the book of Revelation, chapter 3, verse 4, that you are worthy. Revelation 3, 4, that you are worthy. God didn't say that you are an unworthy person. He made us worthy, transformed us into new creature. Now we can stand before the presence of God by the grace he has given to us without allowing Satan to belittle us. Because God had placed Christ as our advocate. Therefore, we stand our ground. In the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, the Bible called us the righteous. Therefore, you become righteous before God. Regardless of what you have done in the past, you are the righteous of God. All will remind Satan and tell him, well, listen, I made mistakes some years back. I made mistakes yesterday. But the Bible tells me in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, that I am the righteous. He didn't say you are a righteous. I am the righteous of God. And that's who you are. In the book of Zechariah chapter 3, verse 4, the Bible declared, God said, take off that filthy garment from Joshua and now cover him with a new garment, the garment of riches, richness. That is garment of righteousness. God took away that garment of filthiness and covered you with garment of righteousness. Therefore, you got to be walking in that righteousness. Don't let devil to stain your garment. Don't let devil to strip you naked because that's not the will of God for you. But begin to walk in the garment that God has made for you because of the love that he has for you. Next, you are called the beloved of God. What did the, the beloved, when we talk about the beloved, it means you are a darling of God. You are God's darling. In the book of John chapter 15 verse 9, the Bible declared and says, As the Father loved me, I also have loved you. Abide in my love. See what it says there? Even as God had loved the Son, same way Jesus had loved us, therefore we must continue to abide in the love of God. Look at verse 13 and 14. It says, of the 10 John chapter 15, greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. You are my friends if you do whatever I command you. Look at what the, the Bible says there. Greater love, Jesus said, has no man than to lay down his life 
That's how we are so much loved. God loved us that he sent Jesus and Jesus laid down his life for you and for me. Now we are no more servants. We are friends to Christ. And we know that we are his friends because he has loved us, put us where we're supposed to be in life and make us to realize that we are not just ordinary people, but he has made us to be whom he wants us to be. In chapter 17 of John, Verse 23, it says, I in them and you in me, that they may be made perfect in, in one, and that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. That's why we are beloved of God. That's why we are beloved. He has loved us. You know, many times we can see many Christians, it's easy to preach, but to practice becomes the difficult part. Can people look at you and thank God for a person like you? Or whenever anybody sees you, you're putting on long papaya face. If you are behaving like, instead of behaving like Israelite, you behave like Ishmaelite. Every hand is against you and your hand is against everybody. You know, there are people, they cannot rest still or sit still unless they are fighting somebody. Let me tell you what happens in the kingdom of Satan. In the kingdom of Satan, there's no time there is rest there. There is no rest in kingdom. They're always fighting. Anytime you see them in unity, they are fighting a Christian. <laughs> Anytime you see the demons, the agents of Satan, they are in unity, they are all out to fight a Christian. But when there's nobody to fight, they'll be fighting each other. And there are many people who call themselves Christians. Every time there must be somebody to fight. And they fight through the phone or through SMS, or they fight physically, or they use their verbal attack, or they can use also their cheapish behavior, meanness to attack somebody. Is that the way you live? It shouldn't be that way. You are called the beloved. Show for the love of God which you have learned and which you have experienced from God. He that is born of God must grow to resemble his father. Grow to resemble the God of love. Next, we are called Jesus' brothers. Turn your Bible a moment in the book of Matthew chapter 12. We are Jesus' brothers and sisters. In the book of Matthew chapter 12, a moment. Look at verse 49 and 50. It says, And he stretched out his hand towards his, towards his disciple and said, Here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of God, will of my father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. We all are Christ's brothers and Christ's sisters. That's who you are. If you claim to be a brother of Jesus and a sister, how come we don't behave like your, your elder brother? Many of us claim to be Christ's brothers, but we behave like demon friends and Satan's brothers. Why? Here the Bible says in the book of Matthew chapter 12, verse 49 and 50, that you are Christ's brothers and Christ's sisters. Then why do you misbehave? Why do you speak? The words you speak, can your elder brother speak the same word? Can Jesus speak the same word? No. The way you look at opposite gender. Did Jesus look at opposite gender that way? As if you, they are transparent, you can look through them. Lustfulness, the lust of the eyes and lust of the flesh. Yeah. This is it. There are things that we need to begin to ask ourselves. Bible says you're a brother to Christ, you're a sister to Christ. Do you behave like him? That's a question. The way you attack others, Christ didn't attack people. The way you gossip, the way you look down on people, the way you also show your meanness towards people, the way you confront them. Where is the love? That's not Christ. Therefore, we have to change the way we live. You're a brother to Christ. Next, the Bible says you are the temple of God. That's a powerful word. You are the temple of God. In the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 3, a moment. Look at verse 16 and 17. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Verse 16 
and 17, it says, Do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? If anyone did defile the temple of God, God will destroy him, for the temple of God is holy. Which temple you are? You are God's temple. Why do you defile God's temple with all these things, the work of flesh, outburst of wrath, lustfulness, immorality, impurity? Why do you destroy that temple? You are the temple of God. Vagarity. Unreasonable attitude, reasonable words. Even if you live with unreasonable spouse, that is not a license for you to become unreasonable. You're supposed to really show forth Christ's likeness. That's why when Apostle Paul was writing to the church of Philippians, in the book of Philippians, chapter 2, verse 5, it says, Let this mind which was in Christ be in you. Let this character, this attitude, this behavior, this mannerism, which was in Christ, be in you. But can we find it today? Remember, your attitude will determine your altitude, the way you behave. Character is a mirror that shows your true image. People know you by your so-called reputation, but God knows you by your character. That's what's important. And the Bible says in the book of 1 Corinthians again, chapter 6, verse 19 and 20, very clearly says, Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? For you were bought at a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. You are bought with a prize, and that prize is something beyond what you can think about. That is Christ's life. His sacrifice on the cross of Calvary. He died to buy you, to get you out from the dungeon you are. The Bible said, you have been translated from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom, kingdom of light, or kingdom of his son. Therefore, you're bought over. Next. If, you're a, if you are temple of Christ, then you got to behave yourself and learn how to get yourself in line with God. No demon or man can hurt you because you are temple of Christ. How do we know that? The Bible declared in the book of Luke chapter 10 verse 19, Behold, I give you authority to trample upon serpents and scorpions and over all the powers of the enemy and nothing in any form will harm you. You receive that power. Nothing can touch you because you are God's person. You are a property of God. That's who you are. I shared this before with you. A lady was coming out from church service with a young daughter. On the way when they are going back home, there was a rattlesnake crossing over. And that particular Sunday, the pastor was preaching on buying and losing and touched the area of also give, receiving power from God to trample upon serpents and scorpions. So the pastor will lay more emphasis on binding and losing. What you bind on earth is bound in heaven. What you lose on earth is lose in heaven. Bind not losing. This is always one of the weapons we give to new believers to know how to bind and lose because the moment they become Christians, Satan will attack them. So on the way back, the little girl was going in front and the mother was coming on the back. And that's a rattlesnake trying to come, cross over. So the little girl said, hey, we've been in the church all this while. You never tried to cross over. Now we're coming back home. You want to cross over. Why? Well, anyway, I'm not going to kill you with anything, any instrument. But I'm going to kill you with the word of God. Therefore, what I bind on earth is bound in heaven. What I lose on earth is lose in heaven. I bind it, turn it around and die in Jesus' name. And the snake turned around and died. Right instantly. There. The mother was at the back coming. And he said, hey, darling, what's going on here? He said, there's a rattlesnake. Hey, run for your life. He said, no, mom, he's dead. How you know? He said, mom, look at his dead. The stomach is up. He's dead. Then the girl narrated the whole thing. And then mother asked, where did you learn this? 
hey, mom, pastor does preach in the church now. The woman broke down and started crying because probably while in the church, she was thinking about lunch, chocolate boxes, got anything in the fridge, uh, no water in the fridge, must get some water, must do this, must do this. They did not listen to pa pastor. was preaching and she was just there, probably smiling. As if she was listening, but she wasn't listening. Just as you're looking at me now. Probably the majority of you are not listening. Yeah. Maybe you're just looking at me. I feel I'm an, an actor. I'm not an actor. I'm not a Hollywood or Bollywood actor. So this was going on. So the woman broke down and began to cry. It's important that you know what God said. You have received power, authority. That's why in the book of Acts chapter 1 verse, in the book of Acts chapter 1 verse 8, the Bible declared there, when the Holy Ghost has come upon you, you shall receive power. You got the power. Begin to bind and lose. You will see what the Lord will use you to do. Because that, he wants to use you to prove that he is sovereign. Let's continue. Next, you are king and priest unto the Lord. King and priest unto the Lord. So, huh? Are we? Yes. In the book of Revelation chapter 1, a moment. Revelation chapter 1, verse 5 and 6. The Bible says, And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler over the kings of the earth, to him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood, and has made us kings and priests, to him, his God and Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. You are king and priest unto the Lord. Now, if you are king and priest, a king's word cannot be overturned. You must know it. If you're a king, your word remains. No one can ever question the authority of your word. You say, how do we know that? Turn your Bible a moment in the book of Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes chapter 8, a moment. Ecclesiastes chapter 8. Look at verse 4. It says, Ecclesiastes chapter 8, verse 4. Where the word of a king is, there is power. And who may say to him, what are you doing? Look at that. Because you are a king unto the Lord, when you speak for your word, Satan cannot question it. But you must know that you're speaking word based on the word of God. Authority put in your life. Don't just go and start talking here and there. Talking in the air. Where the word of the king is, there is power. That's why the Lord has given you power, authority. You can buy, you can lose. Job 22, 28, you can decree. Devil cannot. Say anything about that. Because kings reigns and kings have the final authority. When they speak, they speak forth. Remember, the kingdom of God is not democracy. You must know that. <laughs> That's why many churches are not standing today because there is democracy in the church. The, king, the kingdom of God is not democracy. You must know it. But it is theocracy based on the word of God. It's not based on democracy. You know, when you go to families also, instead of us to practice what the Bible says, husband is the head. Husband, love your wife. Wife, submit to your husband. It's the other way around. Democracy. And that's what they cannot hold. Things fall apart. The center cannot hold. It's time we, when we practice the word of God in everything we do, you see there'll be a change. Yes. Many people find it difficult to obey God. You do not submit your husband because your husband is worthy. You submit your husband because God said so. <laughs> you don't love your husband because your husband is worthy to be loved. But you love him because God said so. The same thing goes. You don't love your wife because your wife is the object of love. You love her because God said so. You are just obeying God. When you go contrary to God's word, well, your family will be shaken up. That's true. No two words about that. You must know it. The devil or circumstance does not have the final authority in your life. 
The last say is yours. You have the last say because you are a child of God. We have the balance of power. We, the Christians, have the balance of power. We can decide even the fate of a nation. We have the balance of power. We can choose who will be there or who will not be there, who will, represent or who will not be representing us there because we have the balance of power. We can use the authority of God to remove who, whoever is in the authority because we have the balance of power. Next, Romans chapter 8, verse 17. The Bible says we are heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. Have you ever known that you are heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ? Whereby we are to reign and rule with him because that is the will of God concerning your life. You are not just ordinary person in the kingdom of God. You have rights, you have privileges. You have what Christ has made, kept for you so that you will know what belongs to you? In verse 17, he said, And if children then heirs, heirs of God and John heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. You will enjoy whatever he has planned for you. That's why when Jesus rose, he said in John 14, 1, 2, 3, Let not your heart be troubled. I am going to prepare a place for you. Where I am, there you will be. He had gone to prepare a place for us. Therefore, we are to reign with him. We are to rule with him. We are to enjoy, be glorified together because he had gone before us. You are joint heir with Christ, but heir with God. If you know these things, you will never see yourself as orphan without a heavenly father. Next, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 20. You are ambassador for Christ. That's a powerful position for you and I. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 20. We are Christ's ambassadors. What did the Bible say then? Now and then we ambassadors for Christ. Although God, we are pleading through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. We are Christ's ambassadors. We represent heaven on earth. Ambassador is a person who dwells in another nation, representing his nation in another nation. He represents the policy of his government in another state or country. He does things according to his home government, even though he dwells in another country. We are God's people. We are Ambassadors of Christ rare on earth. We represent heaven on earth. We represent Christ. We are, listen, we are royal diplomatic agent of Christ. We are heavenly diplomatic agent of Christ. We are God's diplomats here on earth. We must represent Christ wherever we are. Speak forth his word with power and authority. Represent what God represents. Speak what God speaks and do what God does. Obey the command from heaven. Though we're on earth, we must always behave like heavenly people. But it's so sad. Many people are so-called heavenly-minded, but earthly no use. But I tell you the truth, they're not heavenly-minded. They're earthly-minded, heavenly no use. Are you one of them? All they pretend as if you're very heavenly-minded. But you know it that you are not heavenly-minded. You're earthly-minded and heavenly no use. If we claim to be Christ's ambassadors... <laughs> You will never be afraid of anything because you know every step you take will be backed up by God. Every ambassador can declare anything in any country, representing his home country, and say, this is what we stand for, and we're not going to agree with you. Yes. And so it will be. Therefore, if you are here on earth, you need to represent Christ in your way of talking, behavior. Christ was here on earth. Look at how he related to people. Many of us today are using Christianity as a cover-up to do evil. <laughs> we use Christianity as a cover-up to do evil. When you walk, people will say, by the Spirit, I'm led by the Spirit. I remember an incident when a lady told me, Pastor, I couldn't stand that guy. The way he was talking, the Holy Spirit told me to slap him. I slapped him. I said, Sister, Holy Spirit is not spirit of violence. Tell you to slap the guy, I doubt. 
That might be what you think and not what God said. You better go and ask for forgiveness. It's time for us to begin to learn how to follow God. It's time for us to begin to learn how to represent him here on earth. Even the way you talk, talk with love, act in love, speak the truth with love. Let anyone who comes close to you smell the aroma of Christ. I always say, Christians are supposed to be like durian. Wherever you are, you'll not be hidden. People will smell you. Mm. Oh, that's durian. That's durian. That's how we're supposed to be. Wherever you are, let's begin to diffuse the aroma of Christ. Show forth what Christ stands for. The way we talk. Don't just go because you want to please people. Want to make people to be happy. But let it be that you are pleasing God. Sometimes you begin to do evil because people tell you to do that. In the book of Proverbs chapter 1 verse 10, the Bible said, My son, when, people, when sinners entice you, do not consent. Don't agree with them. And in the book of Galatians chapter 1 verse 10, the Bible said, If you seek to please man, you will not be son of Christ. You will not be a born servant of Christ. Ambassadors always represent their home country. We must represent heaven on earth. Behave like we are in heaven, even though we are on earth, in our words, in our actions, in our deeds. Next, we are peculiar treasure. Peculiar treasure unto God. It's a powerful name we can receive from the Lord. In the book of Exodus, chapter 19. Exodus, chapter 19. Look at verse, verse 5. We are peculiar treasure unto the Lord, says the Bible. Now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be a special treasure to me above all people, for all the earth is mine. You will be a peculiar treasure. That's what it says. Peculiar treasure. We must always learn to be peculiar treasure unto God. Peculiar treasure. Because God is real. He wants us to be that and we must be it. And in 1 Peter chapter 2, a moment. 1 Peter chapter 2. In verse 9, it says, But you are a chosen generation, a royal priest to the holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the presence of him who call you out of darkness into his marvelous light. We are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a special, peculiar people unto God. Wherever you are going, are you going for a job? Are you working? Wherever you are, in your workplace, in the church, in the ministry, whatever you're doing, if you can remember that you're a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy people, a special people unto God, you will never fail. You behave accordingly. All this Characters, as we have read them out, you let them be dominant in your life. You will never lose your ground. You always be a living testimony. You know, the problem is people have become so sinful that righteousness has eluded them. But if we become so righteous, sin will not away from us. The world we are living today is a world of flight and pursuit. If we don't flee from evil, evil will catch hold of you. If you don't pursue righteousness, righteousness will elude you. You must continue running. You cannot stand. Continue running until the race is over. In the book of Malachi, chapter 3, verse 17, the same thing is also spoken. Peculiar treasure. I love that because whenever I read that of Malachi, it, makes, it gives a sense of direction, sense of satisfaction that God is real and God really treasure me. And I know God really treasure you too. In the book of Malachi. You know, whenever we talk about Malachi, everybody say, bring all the tithe. We're not talking about tithe now. Malachi 3.17. They shall be mine, says the Lord of hosts. On that day, on the day that I make them my jewels. And I will spare them as a man spares his own son who serves him. We belong to him because we are his own treasure. We belong to God. Next, we are eagles. 
The Lord has made us eagles. Isaiah 40 verse 31. Proverbs chapter 1 verse 17. Why eagles? God has given us a piercing eyes. We can see through. God has given us also wings, even though we do not fly, but we soar. Ego has wings. It doesn't fly. It soars. What does ego do? Ego will always go to the high mountain, on the top of the mountain, and ego begins to watch the direction of the wind, and it will soar with the wind. Same thing. You and I need to go to the mountain of our prayer, and there, watching the revelation, soar in the spirit of God, and let his revelation be unfolded to us. We are eagles. Have our span of wings very broad when we stretch it because of God in our lives. We can cover grounds. And we always soar. We have wings, we don't fly, but we soar. That is God, supernatural. That is what God does for you and I. Next, we are sheep of the, of the great shepherd. In the book of John, chapter 10, a moment. John 10. Look at verse 11 through 14. It says, 11 through 14, John, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. But a hireling, he who is not the shepherd, well, who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf catches the sheep and scatters them. The hireling flees because he is a hireling and does not care about the sheep. I am the good shepherd, and I know my sheep, and I'm known by my own. You see what the Bible says there in verse 15? As the Father knows me, even so I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. You see what it says? He is the great shepherd. We are his sheep. We are not the goats of the Lord. We are the sheep of the Lord. We are totally dependent upon the Lord. Sheep is always totally dependent upon the shepherd. He just follow the shepherd wherever he goes. Same thing, we are the sheep of the shepherd. Our shepherd is not a hireling. A hireling will always run when there's wolf, but our, our shepherd will always be there for us. Remember, in the Old Testament, the sheep died for the shepherd, but in the New Testament, the shepherd died for the sheep. That's how much he loves us. That's how much he cares for us. That's how much he has done for you and I that we must learn to live and let him be all in all for us. The Bible declared in the book of Psalms one, Psalm 23, verse 1 through 6. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pasture. That's what the Bible says there. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pasture. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely, Goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. This is God's word. He is our shepherd. We lack nothing. He lifts up beside the still waters, not troubled waters. He restores our soul. He lifts up beside the path of righteousness for his name's sake. Yes, though we walk through the valley of death, we will fear no evil. Because he's our shepherd. Regardless of what you face, anyone who seeks God first will find him at last. But the problem is we don't seek him first. We do things as we want. We follow the crowd. Remember, salvation is individualistic. Salvation is individualistic. God is not going to say, well, because you belong to this big church, all of you will go to heaven. No such thing. Individual. Individual. Ask the same question. What kind of relationship do you have with God? Do you know the word of God? Do you know how to pray? Do you know how to seek his face? Do you know how to use his word 
to overcome the forces of darkness? Do you allow him to open your eyes to see beyond your natural ability? Or you just depend, just follow others because there are many people who just follow them and go. It's time we begin to think about our lives. It's time we begin to ask ourselves this question. What kind of life am I living? Let us follow the Lord. Walk like Jesus walked and talk as he talked. Let us know who we are in Christ, what we are and where we are. Who we are in Christ, we are Christ's ambassadors. What we are in Christ, we are sons of God. Where we are in Christ, we are sitting in the heavenly places with Christ Jesus. When we know all these things, then we shall be more than conquerors. The will of God is for us to be winners and not losers. God wants us to be victorious and not victims. God wants us to triumph in everything and not to lose out. Ask yourself this question tonight. Am I living for Christ or am I living for self? When you hear the voice of God, you know how to go.